Welcome to Improvement, the podcast show. My name is Ichiro Takahashi, and each week we bring you the person or the message that will help you improve your life. Thanks for tuning in. Now, let's begin your journey. This week's guest is my friend Kate Gill, who is a successful cognitive coach. She helps introverts to build their confidence, set boundaries, and understand and respect their own needs so they can live an authentic, fulfilling, and burden-free life. We talk about her self-improvement journey, self-awareness, self-love, human consciousness, introversion, shyness, social anxiety, automatic thoughts, and so much more. So, without further to say, please enjoy. How are you doing, Kate? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you set to be in this episode. Of course. Yeah, well, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. I've been following you for a while, and I can relate with your content. So I enjoy reading what you write. So I'm not going to say I know you, but I may know, you know, more than the, the people that are listening right now. So I would love if you could tell us about what you do and your background, because I feel that they, didn't, they are in some way connect. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So I'm, I am a core energy life coach. Um, and I work specifically now with um, introverted people, mostly women, but I do I do work with some men um, around improving confidence and self esteem while learning how to respect their energy. Um, So my background a little bit, um, I I was kind of all over the place uh, for a long time. And um, I studied a lot of different sciences when I was in school, um, from neurobiology to psychology, ended up doing um, research science and got a degree in conservation. Um, So I was kind of all over the place with that. Um, And then when I left school, I really just didn't know what to do. Um, and I had had kind of a long history with, um, trying to figure out how to manage anxiety, depression, all sorts of things like that. Um, and I felt like I wanted to do something that included that experience, but at that time I didn't really know what that was. So I ended up, um, in a nine to five doing consulting. So strategic consulting for an ed tech startup. Um, And the more I did consulting, the more I realized that my favorite part about the job um, was when I was talking to professors, because that's who I did the consulting with was professors. Mm. Um, So I would talk to them and and work with them um, on ways to incorporate um, more active learning into the classroom, which was was my, my focus in that role. And I faced a lot of the same barriers that I do now with clients um, around their, you know, not feeling confident teaching a new way or, or struggling to connect with some of their students because there's a very significant cult- cultural gap um, with the with the age difference there. So I spent some time in that role. And then I actually had a friend who um, is also a coach who was starting the journey. And um, I got to watch her go through it and realize that that was a really great path for me. Um, so I ended up going and, and going to a school that, that taught you how to coach because um, it was important to me to know that if I was going to work with people in such an intimate setting, that what I would be doing uh, would be something that would be beneficial to them. So um, there's the ICF, which is the International Coaching Federation, um, and they have all of like the standards for conduct and, and the skills that you need to know to be a coach. Um, So I went ahead and I I did that. And now what I do specifically is I work with women around building confidence and really improving self-esteem. Wow, that's that's awesome, Kate. (laughs) Really. Um, It is a thing I really want to talk about with you, Kate, because I know you are successful right now. You are confident, but you weren't always like this, especially a confident woman, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, so could you tell me how was the old gate? <laughs> um, yeah. So I have had a couple of different points in my life that kind of classify that. But as a teenager, 
I was the angriest little creature you could ever imagine. I was so mad at everything all the time, just sitting in like this pit of anger. And it's like any little thing that came at me, I was so mad, but I wasn't able to articulate any of that. So I think after some time of like sitting in that anger, I found out that it was just easier to, to like go into that place of not feeling anything really at all. And that's kind of where uh, my past with struggling with depression um, kind of came into play. And I do struggle with anxiety and I still have some issues with anxiety now. Uh, and that's something that runs in my family too. But those things all combined um, kind of led to, you know, me being in a really bad place for a long time, being just kind of, you know, feeling down, um, definitely not feeling like I could, I could take on the world in the way that I do now for sure um so definitely it was it was not easy um, and it took a long time for me to understand um what was happening why I was feeling the way that I was feeling and what to even do to start to kind of solve some of those concerns I love that you mentioned the word understand instead of change or fixing you know because I believe that um There is a, a, a thing on the world of self-help where people like to, to use this word like it's like fix something that is change something that is wrong with you, you know. And I feel that first you should understand what's going on with you instead of thinking that, oh, shit, I'm, that, that, is, that is something wrong with me, you know, or inside me. So I feel that it's less change, even though I love the word change, but less change or more, <laughs> more like self-awareness you know yes and you know one thing that I think about all the time is this idea that like everybody is doing the best that they can with their current level of consciousness nobody is you know everybody is perfect nobody is broken nobody needs fixing like if you want to to change a, something about you that's amazing go for it but there's nothing wrong with you and Everybody, even the people that we see that we're just like, oh, my God, this is a lot. <laughs> Everybody's just doing the best that they can with what they have in the moment. Okay. I, I, here I want to stop because I, I agree with you so much and I disagree with you. I, I don't know why. <laughs> look, I love that you mentioned current level of consciousness. We are doing our mm -hmm. best. We are current level of consciousness because I do believe that most of humanity, and it's going to sound like this is like crazy, but... I believe most of humanity lives on an autopilot mode, right? Like our unconscious oh, yeah. guide us, right? We, we respond to our mind. Our mind sends a signal. You know, we, we feel emotion and we react. We are not in control. Mm -hmm. Okay? So yeah. I, I love when you mentioned that. But also, um, but first, let's, let's dive deeper in, into this. How do you, you, you see the, this world of consciousness, unconsciousness, autopilot, emotional reaction. Uh, what's your, your, your point of view? Yeah, so this is the core of the type of coaching that I do. So I do core energy coaching. Um, and essentially, the way that I look at people is that we are all full of all these different kinds of energy. Uh, and there are two kinds, and it's catabolic and anabolic. So there's a building up kind of energy. And these are related to the different um, physical components, like adrenaline and cortisol would be catabolic um, chemicals that happen in the brain. Those break down the systems. So like when people say they work well under stress, mm -hmm. that's because they're experiencing that catabolic energy. And while they can have some short-term results with that, that's something that is literally breaking down the cells in their body versus there's anabolic energy, um, which, is those, which are those building up forces. And those are chemicals that are released in the body that help the systems to run smoother. So the way that I look at energy is that people have um, catabolic and anabolic energy, but when under stress, they switch into that catabolic state. And so they're looking at the world through a certain lens. Um, so we have like seven energy levels that we, that we go to. So the first one um, would be kind of the lowest level of awareness. And um, that's more of that catabolic energy versus the seventh is the highest level of aware awareness. And that's the anabolic energy. And so essentially we look at this as like you could put on um, the lenses, like a pair of sunglasses and look at the world through, you know, level one or level two. And that's going to impact the way that 
um, you're able to see situations occurring around you. So to, to give an example, I think back to when I was younger and I was incredibly angry. Um, so that's catabolic energy. It was breaking me down. Mm. But I was seeing the world through a lens of conflict. I wasn't able to see the, you know, maybe more positive solutions that were available to me because I was seeing the world through a place of conflict. Um, so that's kind of how I see that. <laughs> yeah, I got it. How do you think the normal human being, the, a normal person like you or me, can raise our level of consciousness? Great question. So um, I think awareness is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Just first of all, that, that first step around awareness of like, this is how I'm seeing the world and this is how it's impacting me. Because once you understand, then you're at choice. Then you get to choose what you want to do. Um, so that's something I work with a lot of clients around where it's like, okay, you know, maybe they have pretty okay lives, but they do want to wait, raise their level of awareness. Mm. So what we do then is, is we look at the way that they're approaching situations in their lives. And we look at what that would look like if they were bringing in a higher level of energy. Um, and it's slow shifting of awareness. Wow. That's, that's amazing. You know what, what, what's going on with my mind when you mentioned like raising awareness mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. raising awareness about ourselves means like looking inward. Right. And yeah. I feel that this is a, I don't like this word because it's kind of like conflicted, but it's like a threat to our egos, you know, because we created throughout our life an identity of who we are and how we are. Right. And raising that, that, that awareness means that we are challenging everything that we are, you know. Oh, yeah. And it can be tricky, too, when you think about that, because there are a lot of people that they don't want to be confronted with these parts of their personality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, part of that awareness comes with that idea of like, you are acting this way. You've been this person for a reason. And you're you're actions are there you know if you're responding in a particular way maybe it's to protect yourself so understanding okay i have these patterns here i have these experiences for this reason you know and and i don't have to now that i understand that they're there i get to choose but i think it's understanding that we are doing the best that we can with what we have available to us and then that's where that forgiveness comes into play mm, i see I got it. So now, the thing that I disagree with you, but actually, mm -hmm. uh, the more you talk, uh, the more that I kind of understand your point of view is when you say that we don't, there is nothing wrong with us. That I mean, there is nothing that we have changed. You know, we, you are doing good as you are because, and here is when where perspective I I feel that takes place because I feel that if we fall into that mindset our evolution, our progress is kind of get blocked, you know? So, but I, but this is, this is the, the way that I reframe it. I feel that we should always aim to improve ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if we don't start from a point where we are like, okay, my current life is something that I don't like, that for me is not fine or okay, you know, you need that to start moving towards, you know, um, I don't know what is, what's your take on this. Yeah, no, I actually completely agree with you. So the one thing that I think is, is something that I keep in mind is that I don't think people are good or bad or right or wrong. Um, I think that we can definitely realize that we are in a place where we want to change and make change. Um, and I think that that's important. I definitely prescribe to the idea of constantly growing. Um, my personal development is, is key in my life. Um, but at the same time, that, that growth, that development, it has to come from a place of self-love. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's not going to be genuine. I see. So unless, you, yeah, unless you forgive yourself for, you know, your perceived, like, wrongdoings, then that growth that you're pushing forward with, it's, it's not going to be sustainable because it's not coming from a place of self-love. It's coming from a place of, you know, self-hatred. 
Yeah, I see. Well, I can relate with that because part of my self-improvement journey um, comes from that place. Like I feel like I, I, I come from a place of scarcity, fear, resentment, and self-hatred, you know, mm-hmm. but, and maybe that's the reason why my, my, my opinion is biased because I feel that, I feel that unless you have, you know, we humans being have like basic, basically two, um, motivators we are running away from something or we're moving towards something you know right like you try to avert something or you trying to you desire something and for me was the first one was i was trying to avert something i i I hate who i was you know um but i wasn't aware now i'm I'm all over the place i'm sorry but what you mentioned (laughs) the first thing that you mentioned and that i like i understand more now is that there's no no one is wrong it's right, it's bad, or it's good. It's just that their current level of awareness of what's good, what's bad, what's wrong, right, is, is all what they have. So we should feel that compassion from them, for them, right? Um, and coming back to the, this is my question. Let me wrap it up. What's the, how thin is the line between I love myself, I accept who we are, who I are, right? And I'm going to push myself to become better because I feel some people. Is, I feel some people just, you know, sleep on the idea that okay, I love myself. There's nothing wrong with me. I am going to do nothing to improve myself. Or if I'm going to do something to improve myself, I'm not going. I'm going to push myself, right? Because we all can do. We all we all can always like run the extra mile. You know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think, honestly, when I think about that, somebody, in my opinion, um, who really does love themselves, I feel like a part of that is pushing yourself to become better. I feel like that's a part of self-love. Mm-hmm. So when somebody is in this place of loving themselves, they open themselves up to curiosity. They are not protecting themselves from failure. And so when you're not coming from this place of like, oh, I can't fail or that's the end. That's the end of it. I am a failure if I, if I don't succeed at this thing. Mm. Then you open yourself up to a world of curiosity. Um, and, and that allows you so much more than pushing yourself out of this idea of like, if I don't do this, I'm not good enough. Mm. Um, and, and I think it just really opens up the world. And so I think when people are coming from a place of, of genuine self-love, um, they are pushing themselves. They are still growing. And if they're not, then I think I would ask them, like, what are you trying to protect yourself from? Mm -hmm. What are you afraid that you cannot achieve? I see. That's awesome. When did you realize you wanted to improve your life? Um, so I think I always knew that I wanted it to be better. Um, especially, you know, with mental health, it gets really tricky because I think everybody wants somebody to toss them a rope and pull them out of the pit. Um, but everyone's afraid, you know, not everyone, everybody has different, different things. But for me specifically, um, I didn't have the words for a long time to understand and then articulate how I was feeling um, because they don't really teach you. I mean, they teach you the overview of like, this is what depression is. This is what anxiety is, but you don't understand and especially in American culture they they don't teach you like this is how to truly explain how you're feeling and then also on top of that to be respected when you when you put those emotions out there um because I didn't come from a very emotionally intelligent family <laughs> my my parents and I have two brothers too and um, none of us have been ever particularly good about you know explaining our emotions or talking about feelings so it was a totally new language that I needed to learn to be able to ask for the help that I needed. And then also to get over the fear of being seen as unstable or less than because there still is stigma around mental health. Um, and so I think I'm forgetting your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. By the way, I can relate so much with that because it's a sensation of, awkwardness and out of the place Mm -hmm. because you never seen someone being open right with with their emotions so you feel like well it's 
it's it's okay if I do that this for the first time, you know. But mm-hmm. I ask, when did you realize you wanted to improve your life? Yeah, so so that I think the moment that was really defining for me, and, and there wasn't, I won't say that there was like a super defining moment, but um, when I was in college, I was in a circus for a little bit. Um, and that was something I had done to really just kind of get myself out of my comfort zone. Um, and at that point, I was still really struggling. And I actually fell learning a new trick and I broke my spine. <laughs> and I remember just kind of laying in the hospital bed at the ER and thinking like, I can't, I can't keep feeling like this because I, I wouldn't let my family come see me. I was just like in the emergency room with a broken spine. And I was making a joke out of it because that's always how I went about things and the nurses thought I were, was crazy they were like why are you laughing about this you have a broken spine um and I think it was like in that moment when I was laying in that hospital room alone where I was just like I feel so alone and I don't want to feel this alone ever again and I know that this is caused by me um and I think it was, it was in that moment where I was like, I want change. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel happy. I want more for myself than this sense of like loneliness and feeling like a burden. Wow. That's, that's, I wasn't expecting that. That's <laughs> because uh, I, I, I was researching you, right? Reading your blog and watching like, your feed on Instagram and I wasn't expecting something like that. (laughs) That's, that's awesome. Sorry to throw you for a loop there. (laughs) Tell me, what was your action plan? You, you are lying, laying on the bed, right? And you decide, okay, you know what? I don't want to be, I don't want to feel this sensation of loneliness no more. What was your action Mm -hmm. plan? Well, you know, I didn't have one. And that's, I think, part of what makes it so tricky is I didn't know fully what was available to me. Um, I had, you know, tried therapy a little bit when I was in high school um, and it hadn't gone well. I just didn't have the right therapist, I think, for where I was at at that point in my life. But my first thought was like, okay, what can I do? And so I started eating healthy, started doing all that, but that didn't help with my mental health. And, And so as I started, as after I made that decision, I slowly started to learn more things that were available to me that I just didn't know of at that time. Um, And so I did end up going to therapy and um, again, and and doing all of that. But that even too was, was tricky because of financial reasons. Um, By the time I started, you know, fully investing in therapy, it's not like my insurance covered it. I, I was, I was living in downtown Chicago and trying to pay rent and then also trying to pay for therapy and, Sometimes it was really tricky. I was thinking, you know, can I go to therapy every week and pay for rent? Like, is that going to be something that's doable for me? Mm. Um, and, and so I think about that a lot when, um, when we think like, okay, people should just help themselves. Because we don't know the tools that are available to us. And even some of the ones that people are saying like, oh, you just need to go to therapy. That's not even available to so many people. But I think for me, the biggest thing was I started analyzing myself Um, and I did make that investment then in therapy to to have somebody to guide me through that process because I did not know how to do it on my own yeah I I I got it in your experience how people decide okay I'm going to improve my life Mm -hmm. I think um that can happen in a, a couple of different ways so one could be that you hit a point where um you're kind of faced with the reality of your life and you're realizing that you don't want it to be that way anymore. Um, Some people, they they go through a really big change or a move and they're like, okay, it's time to toss out the old and in with the new. And for some people, it's a really gradual realization um, of, of just seeing like, I've been this way and feeling this way for so long that I am no longer willing to, to waste my time like this. Um, and I think that 
for every person, that journey to making that decision is different. Mm. I got it. I got it. What will you say, Kate? makes your current mindset so different from your old mindset? Um, so I'd say now I really focus on curiosity. Before, I came from a place of judgment on everything. Pe- you know, when people were speaking to me, I was thinking like, oh, that's a horrible thing to say. Or when I was doing anything on my own, I was judging myself. I was thinking like, how could you, you know, have stuttered while you talked to that person? Or you know, how could you have made that decision? Who are you to, to think that you can want better for yourself? And so I came from such an intense place of, of judgment. Um, and also at that point, just not seeing options. I didn't see the options. I felt more so at the effect of my life instead of as if I was the one creating it, which now at, at the level of consciousness that I have at this point in my life, um, I know that I create the life that I have and that all of my decisions are mine and mine alone and that I get to choose what I bring into my life and the way that I impact others. So I look at the world at this point through, through a lens of curiosity. Um, And I try to really keep judgment out of the equation. Can't say it always happens, um, but I've learned how to put on, you know, a little bit of like a a non-judgment hat. Um, And I can stay very, removed from judgment pretty much with anybody who is not like in my immediate family. (laughs) Mm. Mm -hmm. I see. I got it. Let's talk about the relationship between introversion and self-confidence. And first I'm going to give you my thoughts around this topic. And then you can correct me if I missed something or if I was. All right. Sounds good. Okay. I feel people often confuse introversion with shyness and I believe a lack of self-confidence is linked to shyness and not necessarily to introversion. But I also believe confidence comes from competence, being competence, the ability to do something successfully. And in order to do something successfully, you have to be consistent. And since introverts tend to prefer solitude, you know, they may not engage in as many social interactions as extroverts usually do. I believe they are more prone to lack self-confidence within social environments. So I agree with you, but I think there needs to be more addressed with it. So a lot of people don't understand the actual definition of introversion. Um, So so introversion, like I agree with you in the way that um, people confuse shyness, because shyness is fear of social judgment. Like I'm shy, I'm too shy to speak up because I'm afraid of what other people are going to think. Whereas introversion is really just what your body needs to recover energetically. Introverts, they need that low stimulus environment. That's where they thrive. And in high stimulus environments, they tend to get more burnt out than say an extrovert would. Um, Extroverts, you know, they, they feel recharged in a high stimulus environment. So I think there are a couple things that, that play into confidence there. One is that uh, Western society, especially, really has made extroversion the ideal, Uh, that sense of really kind of flamboyant outgoingness that um, is characteristic of extroversion. That is what we consider the ideal. And so as an introvert, you're told kind of your whole life, well, like, why aren't you speaking up more? Why aren't you engaging more? And so they're pushed time and time again to go out of, um, I guess, like their energetic comfort zone in a way that that isn't beneficial because it's causing burnout. So then their body starts to to train them to avoid that, you know, telling them, you know, you don't go out, you don't do that. And and that's where things like anxiety come into play. Um, So when it comes to confidence and self-esteem, I agree that that, um, seeing that you are competent in something is important. But at the same time, I know some introverts who are the most outgoing people in the entire world. Um, But then, you know, they go home a couple hours early and they get a good night's sleep and they spend that time to care for their energy the way that it needs to be cared for. So I really think that it goes back to that idea of like knowing what you need and then um, having the boundaries in place to allow yourself to take what you need without apologizing. Um, 
And again, I am forgetting your question. <laughs> no, actually, actually, my my main question was like,、um, there wasn't like a, a question.、It、was more like I really want wanted to know the relationship between introversion、mm-hmm. and self confidence. But I like what you mentioned. You mentioned basically an apology, an apology. Oh, I'm sorry, an apology, apologizing, an apologetic、uh, mm-hmm. confidence. Wow,、yeah. that was hard for me. You know, I, well, I love that. It's so tricky too because you think back to being in like first or second grade, and part of the way that you were you were kind of decided if you were doing well or not was how well you're interacting with your peers, and. I remember I had、um, I was a pretty outgoing child、um, up until like the fourth grade or so I was pretty outgoing, but I remember in the fourth grade I got started being a little bit quieter because sometimes the noise that other kids were making things like that were a little overwhelming for me. I really enjoyed sitting back and watching, but I remember getting a note home、um, that was talking about how I wasn't engaging as much in class. Um, and how it was like something that was really concerning. But my grades were phenomenal. I was highly advanced、um, in a lot of areas in school. But it was this big concern that then, like, I had to have a talking to, like, with my parents about,、um, where it was like, well, they say that you're quiet in class. Like, well, I'm paying attention. So I think that you know, a lot of people, a lot of introverted people. Are told as they're growing up, you know, why aren't you this way? Why aren't you as good at playing with the other kids as you know Sally over here is?、Um, and those things they they do stick in your mind because then you start to think, well, why is this wrong with me? What is wrong with me that makes me not want to, you know, stay out to all hours of the night? What about me is wrong?、Um, and I think that that's because we place extroversion as the ideal situation. And that we then don't appreciate the really phenomenal values that introverts bring into the picture. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know, I usually use two words when I talk about my self improvement journey, and those are shyness and social anxiety. And I tend to relate introversion with those two words. Not confuse, but you know, relate. So I don't know if it's a common misconception or if it's only me. I would totally agree that they are related,、um, because when you think about that、um, that kind of social anxiety, if you were coming into every social situation feeling like you had to be someone that was not you. I'm、um, feeling like you know if you're going into a situation, and the only proper way, and I'm saying that with air quotes here, the only proper way is to interact the way that an extrovert would,、um, with focusing on like how do I respond to this question,、um, that can get really overwhelming really really fast, and so then you have these cycles where that kind of proves itself to be true,、um, and and you kind of prove yourself. To yourself that you're not capable of doing it.、Um, when you go into a social situation, you're not coming into it in a way where you're truly being yourself.、Um, then you're not going to succeed. And if you do, it's going to feel, you know, fraudulent.、Um, and there's a lot of just that's going to then prove to those messages in your head that you're not capable of doing that. And then your brain, in order to protect you, is going to.、Um, Kind of give you those. Keep doing that to yourself, and so then you start to do that avoidance. I see. I got it.、Oh, by the way, I literally lost you for、oh, no. okay. one or two seconds. Yeah. Can Can you Can you go back to the last part where you say that your brain、uh, will? Oh no. Okay. And then、uh, I lost yeah, you. Yeah. So so your brain is going to train you if you keep putting yourself into these situations that make you feel bad. Your brain's going to train you to not do that. It's going to start making you have those feelings of anxiety as a way to protect you from ending up in those situations.、Hmm. I got it. I got it. <laughs> And I can relate with that, by the way. However, since I decide, kind of decide,、um, that I wanted to change my 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 social life、uh, precisely, I and I I'm pretty sure that I mentioned this in one of your posts. I use those trigger, those、mm-hmm. signals like the anxiety, like a trigger,、uh, 
I told myself, this is what was my inner thought. Okay, I am feeling this right now. Yeah. This means that I've yeah, got to Yeah, and do that's, it. I think that was the post where I talked about fear being feedback, um, which I love that way of thinking because whenever I'm a self, like, where is this fear coming from? What is my brain trying to protect me from? Because then I can say, like, if I'm walking into a party where I don't know anybody and I'm having a moment of, like, fear or anxiety, you know, what is this trying to protect me from? And social rejection totally is what it's trying to protect me from. So then I can think, like, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen if every single person in this party decides they don't like me? Even if everybody starts telling me they don't like me, what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, so really that fear is just feedback and that's something that you can take and discard if you want or you can take it into consideration um but yeah i love that idea and it really gives you so much freedom from that we keep fear such a heavy word but it's really just an emotion that's supposed to keep us safe definitely i got it could social anxiety be considered the cause or the consequence of being Ooh, shy great question chicken or egg, huh? Um, <laughs> so with that one, I think it could be, I think it could be either. Um, anxiety is a very strange beast because it is a mental health disorder um, that a lot of people can't control. And, and I will say that it depends on the severity of it. Um, but I do think that um, there are certain people that tend to be more prone to like when new situations happen. There've been, there's been a lot of research on, um, on this topic when I'll start with like babies. So when they put babies in new situations, um, there are some babies that will crawl right up and inspect it. And there's some that like to hang back and they're a little bit more nervous. And so when you think about that, there, there is, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. I'm so sorry. Could you ask me the question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. What, what, I was wondering if social anxiety could be considered the cause or the consequence of being shy. And I'm asking this because I like to go to the root of everything, you know. And when you mention that some babies, you know, um, let me let me go first here. Um, once I read, I don't know where, and I can't remember the author, but that. There's a, a theory that we, when we were born, we were born like in a blank state, right? Our mind is like completely blank. So uh, when you mentioned that that study shows that some babies were mm -hmm. like more nervous, or more afraid, right? Um, that means that you might be like, you, you might have a genetic predisposition to be more afraid so than other people, I... right? don't connect that with fear, but introversion and extroversion are genetic. They are. Um, and there, there is full proof of that. And I won't get into that right now, but, um, I think fear is learned. Fear is something that is learned based on experiences. Same thing with shyness. Um, shyness is something that's learned based on okay. previous experiences, but there are some babies that are going to be more cautious. And I think that the best way to think about this is, is we're not the only species that is separated into introverted and extroverted members. Um, and like, if you think about I antelope, uh, which are also separated introverted and extroverted members, they have the members of the group that are more outgoing. They're going to go into new areas, looking for food, looking for better places to bed down, but you're going to have the introverted members of the species that are paying closer attention to you know, threats to, to um, really focusing in and saying, okay, I'm going to be the, the one that sounds the alarm, but I'm not going to be the one that is branching out to find new areas. And that's something that we have evolved into as an entire species for protection purposes. So you have some people that their reward systems get triggered. These would be extroverts. They get triggered by that idea of risk taking. But then you have introverts where they can easily get overstimulated by that same amount of stimulus. So I wouldn't say that they're more disposed to having fear, um, but more so that hmm. it's easier for introverts to develop some of those um, kind of like anxious tendencies, if you will. 
Mm, I got it. And I love that you mentioned two things. And I'm gonna I'm gonna quote kind of quote you. Um feed is learned. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that the world is cautious, mm-hmm. yeah. right? It's not afraid. Cation. I love that. Awesome. Let's talk about okay. introversion and being social. Um, there are introverts who are capable of socializing and introverts who are mm-hmm. skilled at socializing. And those two, for me, are completely different in my opinion. Because the first one endures the situation while the second one makes the most out of the situation. So could you tell me what's the mindset of the social and also yeah, skilled so introvert? I think it really comes from a place um, where not only are you confident in yourself, um, but you also have good boundaries set up. I found that um, introverts can be phenomenal people to talk to because they listen, they analyze what's being said, and they might be a little bit slower to respond, which is okay because they're processing that information. They're analyzing it through their lens, like their views on the world. Um, So there's a lot more that's going on on the inside with introverts um, where their whole focus is not necessarily on responding. Um, but when you get into that conversation, you can have incredible, incredible insights from introverts, um, just because of the way that, that we typically involve ourselves in conversation. But I think the biggest thing with that is, is being comfortable in that idea of like, not feeling like you always have to be in the mode of what am I going to say next? How am I going to respond? Because you feel like you have to, to be, um, you know, the properly involved member of that conversation. Um, so I think that's part of it. And I also think it's important to have good boundaries on, um, how, how long you are fully engaged for, because we do tend to get burnt out, um, more quickly with all of the social interaction. So if I go to a party, the first hour that I'm there, I might have really great, phenomenal conversation. Second or third hour, I'm probably not having much conversation at all. So um, I think it's also having boundaries on, on, you know, how long you let yourself be in that space. I got it. And I can relate with that. I remember, well, for me, when I, when I started to work on, well, on my social anxiety and my social life and my social skills, I used to go out until the clubs were mm-hmm. closing, you know. Um, that means something like between midnight until 5 a.m., and I used to do mm-hmm. that five days per week. And I can relate with what you say because I remember that I, I don't know, like 2, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I used to feel like tired. I wasn't like trying to, to, to talk to so many people. And I, and I mm-hmm. had the idea that was because I was scared. So I was like, dude, how... You can't do this. Look, it's super simple, super easy. You know, so I was also like battling against my my yeah. thoughts, my uh, my guilt, you know. Well, and how so, do you yeah, think I, that I totally journey would have been that. different if you were coming from it, coming into that journey from a place of like, this is going to help me grow as a person and not from a place of there's something wrong with me? I probably will have been, I will probably have <laughs> slept a bit more, pretty. <laughs> um, but, but in my case, mm-hmm. in my case, I never went to therapy. For example, you know, I, I, I all the things that I know and that I learn, I'm, yeah. is self education. So for me, it's like the world, the world self improvement is a hundred percent self improvement. You know. <laughs> figure out a lot of things. For example, um, about social skills and social interactions and human behavior, I had to figure out that by my own. And so what I did was basically spend the time that I wasn't feeling like interacting, looking, you know, I was watching people, how they behave. And th- and this is crazy because when I started to go out, I used to believe that every single guy in the club <laughs> was way more confident than me, for real. I was like, I felt like I was the most shy and unworthy human being there. Like, dude, we are here just to to become that guy, you know? And 
after days and days and nights and nights, I find out that my behavior wasn't that different from the other guys, you know, and girls also, because I used to think that th this is this is gonna so dumb now, but back then was for me like uh, my, my way of thinking. I used to f to think and to believe that if a guy or girl were attractive to me, mm -hmm. to my eyes, mm -hmm. they were confident, you know. And the more that I went out, the more that I interact with people. I realized how actually unconfident some of them were, you know? And, and again, that's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by human behavior, because it doesn't matter how you look, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter how you act. It's finally what's going on yeah. inside of your mind. Yeah, and I totally what agree counts. with that. You know, it's, it's crazy what we can convince ourselves is true when it's not. Um, you know, that we are so much further behind everyone else when really we're all in the same race. So many people are in a really similar spot, but we don't see that. We only see ourselves as, you know, when we're putting ourselves down, we're the worst. We're the absolute worst. And that's the place that we come from. But, you know, in reality, we're all just working to improve. And, and that's why I think confidence comes so much from not necessarily being the best or uh, being really good at something, but in giving yourself permission to fail, in giving yourself permission to fail and then grow, and having that really be that, you know, you are confident in who you are, because you know that you'll bounce back, um, no matter what happens. And I think that's the core of confidence is just knowing that no matter what happens, you're going to figure out a way to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I love it. Now, I'm going to assume you face, especially in your early days as a coach, uh, a certain amount of daily negative automatic thoughts, like this is not going to work, mm -hmm. I'm not ready, yeah. I'm not good <laughs> enough, etc. So, could you, could you verbalize some of the thoughts you have faced? And also, could you walk me through the yeah, process so, you follow it to um, deal with them? I definitely still have those thoughts sometimes. I won't say that I never have them at all. I have them frequently, especially when I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, so when I was first starting out, I was thinking, because I, I am you know, relatively young in comparison to most of the people in this field, um, which I think is, is really phenomenal um, because it gives a fresh perspective to some of the younger people that are wanting to take on these, these self-development journeys. But that was a big trigger for me in the beginning, too. I was thinking, mm -hmm. why would anybody want to listen to me? Nobody's going to take me seriously. Um, I was even thinking, you know, I had all these people from my past that I was like friends with on Facebook when I started my, my business page on Facebook. And I was like afraid for them to find it because I was thinking they're going to look at this and laugh and be like, this chick is the worst person to be a coach. <laughs> and so that slowed my progress quite a bit at the beginning because I was stepping into a new place and all of a sudden from you know corners of my mind these random feelings um, of, of inadequacy started popping up and at that point of course I, I had the tools to know how to deal with them and the first thing for me is identification is really saying like oh I am feeling this and then I'll sit down and I'll I'll write out what I'm feeling and I'll ask myself, what is this feeling protecting me from? And why is it so intense right now? So then I can have that identification of saying, okay, this is coming because I'm trying something new and my brain is trying to protect me from the social ostracis ostrac ostracization. I can't say that word right now. Um, <laughs> that could come with it. And logically then I can think about this and I could say, well, that's not going to happen. Um, and that doesn't matter. And so then I can choose to, to put that feeling aside. Um, and it's really being at choice by understanding where it's coming from instead of letting it completely overwhelm you and then taking a step back for me, just kind of understanding and identifying where those feelings are coming from at this point in my journey is really all I need to be able to choose what action I want to take moving forward. I see. So, for example, in my case, I, I, 
Okay, what I'm going to say is, mm -hmm. is related to the next question that I have. So I personally, I don't ignore my thoughts. I just, I am aware that most of them are really dysfunctional, you know, I'm like they're not useful, mm -hmm. even if they are valid, they're not useful. But when I really have to, like I'm feeling really overwhelmed. I sit down and I, I follow a CBT um, exercise mm -hmm. that is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I just write down like, yeah. what are the proof that I have that that thought is real? And in the other hand, what is the proof that the thought is not real? And most of the time it's like the most unrealistic mm -hmm. idea that is, you know, bothering me. Anyways, you know, I try to be as productive as I can throughout my day. However, sometimes I had to deal with what's coming from my mind. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I was saying, telling you. And the thoughts, the emotions, the sensations. And what I do is to remind myself that the universe, and I know this is going to sound kind of crazy, but it's the way that I, that I, that I think, <laughs> doesn't give a shit about my worries. It doesn't going to st stop expanding itself and know the earth. Is going to stop rotating. I mean, every day people die and every day people is born yeah. and the earth doesn't care, doesn't stop. And it's not that I, that I don't take time to check on me, on my mental wellness. It's just that if every time a negative thought pops into my consciousness and I stop everything I'm doing, I feel I'm giving that thought mm -hmm. so much undeserved attention and power, you know? So... What would be your advice for entrepreneurs like me that want to be as productive as they can, but have to deal with a yeah. certain degree of So the, the first thing thoughts? that comes to mind is, and you brought this up a little bit earlier, was the idea of automatic thoughts. Um, and the brain, it trains its neurons to go more quickly to the thoughts that we have more often. So if we're constantly thinking every time we look in the mirror or every time we open, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, we're looking... And we're thinking like, oh, I'm so ugly, then that's what's going to come to mind the quickest when we end up in that same situation, because that's we're, we're subconsciously training our brain to think a certain way um, by by more consistently using those neural pathways. So when you think about altering that, um, if you're wanting to, to have less of that response of like some of those dysfunctional thoughts, it's about... Um, repetition so much of it is just about repetition so for every time you're thinking you know that you're not capable or you're having whatever dysfunctional thought it is you have to replace that with a better one and I usually recommend like thinking it a bunch of different times like in a row I, I love affirmations for that reason because they really do help to rewire the way that the the neural pathways in the brain go mm. um because so much of it is just like the more you use that neural pathway, the more easily your brain will automatically go to that over another option. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. And I also, and I also love affirmations. Yeah. I, I like to yeah. start my morning with affirmations, for example. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the thing. I, I, it's just that I don't want to stop for an hour. Like I'm working right. Mm -hmm. I'm creating content. I'm contacting people and all of that. And, and I start thinking stuff like, I'm going to verbalize some of my thoughts. For example, I, I think like, dude, why you are contacting so many people? No, none of them is going to reply, right? And stuff like that. So I don't want to stop and be like, okay, I'm going to stop working. I'm going to open my notepad, right? And I start writing down the reasons that that's not true, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, you are definitely yeah. right. Definitely right. Do you think introverts tend to have more dysfunctional thoughts? I think thoughts if than we extroverts? were in a neutral society, which is impossible, then it would be totally equal. <laughs> but I do think that, yeah, I think introverts do have a tendency with the way that our society is built to have more dysfunctional thoughts just because so many of the um, pieces of advice that I say with air quotes here um, and criticisms that, that we get growing up and as we go into a workspace and things like that, they're about who we are. It's not like, hey, you know, you could be better at typing out this email. It's like, hey, why aren't you 
more enthusiastic, like outwardly enthusiastic. And you take that on as, as a piece of yourself is like, I am not right. <laughs> Which I think is like such a, such a strong feeling that a lot of introverts that, that are in that more dysfunctional space are feeling is that there's something wrong with them because they're on the opposite end of what's considered the ideal. And so then you ingrain that into your sense of who, and, and, and that's going to then train your brain to try to protect you from that by having those dysfunctional thoughts more often. I got it. You're mm -hmm. definitely right. Let's go back to your professional life. You mentioned your blog that before becoming a coach, you had a <laughs> lot of jobs that were made for Yes, extroverts. definitely. Could so, you name a couple uh, of them? I worked in the restaurant in industry for a while. I did. Um, I loved being a host, so I was a managing host for um, a couple of you know bigger spots. Um, I also worked. I've worked in some silly jobs <laughs> as I think back at them, but but yeah, I mean, I worked a lot of time in restaurants, and, and the restaurant scene is really made for people that can be outgoing and enthusiastic and charming and. Um, I've been in sales roles, which definitely you got to hop on the phone and people have to immediately fall in love with you or they're going to hang up on you. <laughs> and also, um, yeah, I've had a lot of roles of like customer advisor. Um, even now, I still um, work with a company in downtown Chicago where I do some real estate stuff and I work with clients throughout the day and spend, you know, anywhere from eight to nine hours with them, essentially being an entertainer as we go on a day of um, apartment searching. Um, and so a lot of these, you know, if I was extroverted, they would be so amazing. Um, and I love these jobs. I, I've loved a lot of my jobs, but they can be incredibly draining. And I do have to keep in mind all of my energy as I'm going throughout the day. Mm, I see. How introverts could recognize what type of job yeah well and that depends on the person too see. so i think the biggest thing is if you love something do it do it it doesn't matter if you're an introvert and extrovert if you love it do it but set boundaries learning to set boundaries is so key because i love talking to people i love it i've built a whole career around having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people but at the same time If I do that for eight hours straight, I'm probably going to spend the whole next day in bed. So, <laughs> and I won't want to talk to anybody and I'm going to feel burnt out and I'm not going to feel good. So I think that when you think about a career, you shouldn't think, you know, how can I be my best introverted self? It's like, how can I build a life in this situation that's going to benefit me the most? Um, because, you know having constant conversations with people is not what most introverts would want to do for their work. But um, at the same time, I put really strong boundaries on how long I'll have conversations with clients, when I'm done doing anything on social media. Um, and that's really to care for my energy so that I can avoid that burnout. But I think it's all about awareness and learning what you need energetically to feel good And I don't think that there are any jobs that an introvert should avoid for any reason. Um, if they want to make it work, it's just about being open to um, making the changes to make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, Kate, mm -hmm. let's get into the last, se the last section of the oh, show. Oh, geez. Okay. Quick questions, <laughs> quick answers. Okay. <laughs> cool. Here we go. Um, mentorship or self-education? Self-education. Because I, Why? you're going to always have a different perspective than someone else. Um, and what works for me might not work for somebody else. So I think mentorship, it's like giving advice. And I think giving advice is one of the, is, is kind of a silly thing because everybody's going to live life a different way. Okay, give me an unpopular, an unpopular opinion about opinion? introverts. Yes. Wait, so like an unpopular opinion that other people have that I agree with or don't agree with? That, oh, well, that's a common <laughs> question that the, the guests always ask me. Um, um, unpopular you, opinion about introverts is that we hate people. And I think that that's incredibly wrong because I love people. Okay. I think people are wonderful. Well, actually, I, I believe the same. And... 
my idea came from <laughs> Instagram. Actually, I'm gonna blame Instagram because I used you, you put uh, on the search bar the hashtag mm-hmm. introvert or introvert or whatever, you know, and there appear so many memes that make you think that introverts yeah. hate people. Yeah, completely. You know? It's crazy. And I think about For that me, too, and that comes crazy. back to the idea of dysfunction, of of if somebody is coming from that place of hating other mm. people, it's not because of their introversion. It's because of something else that's going on that's making them feel like they don't fit in. And that in turn is making them then turn on the rest of the world as a way to protect themselves. I, my my biggest inspiration to? ever is a woman named Leslie who was my trainer when I went through uh, my coaching certification program. She is, uh, I think of her all the time. Her voice is in my head constantly. <laughs> okay, pick one superpower. Read people's mind. Stop the time. Oh, that's tough. Or become invisible um, at will. Okay, I think I'd pick stop time because I feel like you'd be able to do literally anything. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's the well, second because... time that someone... Oh, sorry. Pick that one. <laughs> well, I was going to the... say, like... If you're stopping oh, no, no, time, it's fine. Please, please. then everybody else is frozen. You can go and you could rob a bank. You could, like, you know, save a, a dog or something like that. You could do anything that you could do while you were being invisible. Yeah. I, 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 and to be honest, I, I, I will pick reading people's mind. I think really? that, just, that is, like, the key to, to anything. Yeah, I guess if you were to be able to read, like, a bank teller's yeah. mind, yeah, you could convince sure. him to let you rob the bank. But I don't know. I feel like I wouldn't want to know what everybody's <laughs> thinking all the time. That just sounds overwhelming to me. <laughs> um, Is there anything I should have good asked, question. but I didn't? Anything you should have asked, but I didn't. No, I think that you've you've done a really comprehensive idea. I think um, I think you've covered a lot of things, and I I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but I won't do that to people. <laughs> Okay, it's fine, Kate. So, Kate, I enjoyed so much the conversation. Thank you for being in the show. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with such a passion and honesty. Thank you so, so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Kate.